to see all of you. We're just always so darn happy to see all of you here. I'll bet some of you are here for the very first time. Am I right about that? Anybody here for the first time? Someone back there? What's your name and where are you from? Jane from Indiana. Indiana. Are you visiting or are you moved here? I'm visiting. All right. It'll be a couple weeks. You'll move here. Anybody else back there for the first time? Yes. Anne. Anne. Yeah. I'm with my mom and I live in talent. Okay. In talent. Very good. Okay, who else is here for the first time? Nobody. Second or third time, maybe. Maybe because we didn't greet everyone last week. All right, what's your name? Really? And we need more Donnas here. We've only got about half a dozen. <laughs> I'm Donna. Yeah, there's, there's Donna. There's a few more out here. <laughs> Was there someone else for the first time? For the third time. Third time, yes. What's your name? Omanasa. Oh, Omanasa. Oh, Omanasa. Oh, well, welcome. Chester. Chester. All right. Welcome. Up north here. Okay. Well, we hope to see you over and over again. We're really excited to have you here. And um, we, we usually like to start with some announcements. But just in case you're not familiar with Unity, we're an omni-faith community. And that means that we honor the, the light of truth that underlays all true spiritual paths. We're not into any one stat, uh, path or the... the dogmas and everything, but just really the truth, the light of truth. So we hope um, that all of you feel welcome here, no matter what your background is, no matter what your spiritual path is. Some of our announcements are that we have a prayer circle that meets at 5 o'clock on Mondays in the back room. You're all welcome to attend. And if you need some one-on-one -on -one prayer, we have uh, a prayer chaplain today, another Donna over there, who would be happy to sit with you after the service and pray with you. And we have some other prayer chaplains that may show up as well. And if you have a prayer request that you would like to have prayed for, please fill out a prayer request form, which is on the back table, and put it in the prayer box, the wooden box back there. Okay, uh, Karen, you have an announcement. You want to make that right off, right front? Uh, it's time for the Siskiyou Singers Spring Concert. And it's a real honey this year. It's all water songs like Shenandoah, Deep River, Mississippi Mud. It's just great, great fun, and the singers are sounding wonderful. So the performances are next Saturday at 7 and next Sunday at 3. So I do have some tickets, and I urge you to come. It's just a terrific, terrific concert. Where's Where is it? Oh, it? yeah, it's at the uh, SOU on uh, Mountain. The music hall, music hall. <coughs> on mountain. Plenty of parking right across. Just a great program. Okay, thank you for announcing that. I would like to take a few moments just to talk about service. Now, if you were with us last week, you remember that Norman talked about service, and that includes service in our community, our unity community right here. And I, I know that I pass around um, a sign-up sheet every now and then for people to sign up to help out because we have a lot of things that we do in the morning. But I just want to explain some of it because some people don't really know what happens. And maybe if we know what happens, we can all participate. Instead of just the one or two people that sign up each week, it could be all of us doing little parts, and then there's less to do at the end. So just to let you know, when I get here in the morning, the first thing I do is close all the Venetian blinds. And that's not so that you can't look outside. You know, I know it's more fun to look out there. But for the video, it works better, so we don't have the glare. So when we're in our big circle at the end, it might be cool if some of the people over here just maybe open the blinds. Some of the people over there might open the blinds before we go back and enjoy refreshments. That's one way you can participate. Um, these, these banners, you know, we tried to get the ones with feet that would walk back there all by themselves. <laughs> they were out, so we got the kinds without feet. So these just need to be taken back and put in, in the proper place, and someone can show you where that is. We bring out a couple of folding tables. One has the name tags on and all that. The other is the greet, greets you when you come in. Those need to get put back in the storage place, but before that happens, of course, the tablecloth has to be folded. And before that happens, the stuff on top of the tablecloth has to be put away. So it's kind of like a process, and it's something we can all participate in. Because we actually have to be out of here by 1 o'clock, and sometimes we're still having such a good time, I know we don't want to leave here. 
But I'm going to actually try something today. I'm going to, around 10 to 1, I'm just going to ring a bell, and that's your signal. Oh, we have to be all the way out. Everything has to be cleaned and put away. The floor swept. We don't have to do the ceilings. That's the good news today. <laughs> I'm not going to make anyone do the ceilings. But anyway, if you can all just help out some, that would make it so much more pleasant. And then no one has to sweat. You know, we just look really disgusting when we sweat when we put all that stuff away. So that way we can all be part of the community even more deeply. We uh, have some other volunteer opportunities, someone to take digital photos for a future directory. And Jane's not here today. She's sick today, but she would talk more about that sometime. Someone that can do our videos for RVTV. Stuff like that. So anyway, that's a way to participate. Now, our big announcement is next Sunday. What's next Sunday? Big announcement. Yes. You got it. Wow. A fundraiser. A fundraiser. We are having a big fundraiser. And we thought we would have some flyers today, but we, we don't. But I'm going to get some flyers probably by tomorrow. And if there's any volunteers that could help to take them around town. What is the big fundraiser? It's right here. It's next Sunday evening. That's April 28th. Right here at the Hondra. 7 o'clock until 9.30. It'll be our own Reverend Norma speaking and Neil Donald Walsh, best-selling author of Conversations with God. They're going to be speaking. We're going to have music by our wonderful Heather and Richard and Jane, who's not here, but she would be back there if she were here, and maybe a couple other people. We're going to have some kirtan music, and there's going to be dancing. So it's going to be a fun time. It's going to be a wonderful time. You can bring your questions about the meaning of life, and Norma and Neil will expound on those things. We may find out what is that actual meaning of life. They have a week to figure it out. So we hope that you will come to that, and please bring all your friends and let the word be spread around. Let everyone know it's going to be a big deal. We want every single space here that the fire laws allow to be filled. Okay, last announcement. Of course, this is like Earth Day weekend, and next week is Arbor Day, and I spent some time in the Redwoods yesterday, and I think about trees, and there's that old saying, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, did it make a sound? Well, there's another deep, deep question about life. If a cell phone rings in the middle of church and everyone is asleep anyway, <laughs> did it ring? I don't know, and we're not going to find out, because we're turning them off, right? Yes, we are. All right, welcome to Unity, and I'll turn it over to Norma. forward to celebrating with you today. Yes, we have Earth Day. How many of you went to the Earth Day celebrations at Science Works? It was a wonderful yeah. gathering of, of our whole community there. Um, and also this week, a lot has happened in our world, with what happened in Boston at the marathon. Uh, and so I set the title for uh, the topic this week before all of that, and uh, thinking about Sometimes we need to pause and ask ourselves, who is God to me? And in many spiritual paths, it's very defined for people. They're told this, this, and this. You know? But in our liberal spiritual path, or um, omni-faith as we call it, it's much more up to us to come to something within ourselves to understand who is God to us. So I thought it would be interesting for us to examine that together, and especially on this Earth Day, because we say that we're an organization of unity that celebrates Earth-based spirituality. So go on a journey with me, and we'll see where we end up in, inside of your own understanding of who God is for you. We are all on a journey, whether people admit it or not. We as humans are all on a journey. To discover this and it's a very personal journey for each one of us so let's see what happens today in your journey we have a, a wonderful medley of songs that are earth-based spirituality and you're going to want to as soon as they get going you're going to want to stand up and participate and really feel the body coming present here and the earth <coughs> under our feet Excuse us, we're on. 
honoring the drum and basing the song on the drum. And the drum is very changeable. It's moved around a lot. It wants to speak to you.
talking about God is one thing, but we come together in community in times like this not just to talk about or to think about or to be in our minds, but to come into our hearts and our bodies and to actually experience something of Godness. And so it's, it's sort of like if you were wanting to know about bicycles and you read all up about them and you read about their gear shifts and their brakes and everything and you never got on a bicycle. <laughs> so you have to get on the bicycle to know what bicycles are really about. So meditation is kind of like that. So I'm going to lead you in this beautiful Earth Day meditation so that you can get on the bicycle and experience the energy of, of Godness in our midst. So, Settle into your chairs and feel your hips on the chair. That brings your energy down and in. Begin to breathe deeply and relax, knowing that you're in a beautiful sanctuary, a safe place, where you can fully relax and be with your breath. Ah, breathing deeply, relax, and even more. Let your shoulders relax. Your arms grow heavy and relax all the way down to your fingertips, relaxing. And your legs relaxed and growing heavier all the way down to your feet and toes relaxing. Ah, breathing deeply now, I want you to imagine a very old, maybe a favorite tree. Imagine that like a tree, you have roots that stretch deep down into the ground. Feel your roots as they extend deep down into the earth, weaving around and among the rocks, touching underground springs. Your roots pull the sustenance of the earth right up into you, making you strong. Feel the earth giving you strength and nourishment. The earth is your home. Feel it. Just as you are fully rooted in your body, your body is rooted in the earth. Feel yourself relaxing, supported, and sustained, and nourished by our Mother Earth. Imagine that your roots stretch deep all the way down to the core of the earth, and that there, there's a magnetic connection moving between the magnetic core of the earth and your own heart center. As you exhale, you release energy that's no longer needed into the earth. Ah. She transforms it. And as you inhale, you breathe in nutrients, strength, things that you need to nourish your life. Ah. So as you breathe out and in, continual exchange is going on of replenishing energy because you have a magnetic connection with the earth. You are made of the earth. Every molecule that comprises your physical being has been in other bodies and in rocks and plants and animals. Every molecule of which you're composed is of the earth and has been of the earth from the beginning of time. Every molecule of your body has witnessed all of history. You are of the earth. Feel the power and energy of the earth inside of you. All that has ever happened before has been witnessed by the earth. She has witnessed all of history, lived through all of history. The wisdom carried by the earth is awesome. All that lives returns to her. Let yourself relax right now into the great support of the earth. The earth always supports your weight, sustains your life. Feel it. Feel yourself at home wherever you are. You are of the earth, <coughs> breathing with the earth continually. Earth energy continues to move through you. Breathing, 
drawing replenishing energy, inspiring energy, drawing in energy that sparkles and tingles throughout your body, throughout, throughout your whole being, vibrant energy coming to you from the earth. And as you breathe in and out, become aware of your heart now, your center. And notice that whatever may weigh on your heart, whatever may be shielding your heart, anything that may be making your heart stiff or disjointed or cold or disconnected, can be breathed out and released, exhaled and let go of. Feel your heart soften as you come in contact with the earth. Feel the comfort and the goodness, the goodness of creation. Appreciate yourself for all the efforts that you have made to be here and to listen to yourself, your body, your heart, and the earth. Let your heart right now receive love and appreciation. You deserve it. Breathe in love. Feel your heart softening and warming and opening. Feel yourself as a child of the earth, one with this good earth, knowing that you belong here on earth. Thank you, our mother earth. Thank you. Oh. So this song was inspired by a meditation, and during the meditation I felt my hands moving by themselves. <coughs> That's one way I've experienced feeling God is the God bumps and the, the movement of the body. And, um, but I knew that it was something bigger than myself, you know, spirit moving through, but I also knew I could stop it at any time. So this is called Dancing with the Angel. Somewhere 
Once upon a time, in a land where it was very green, and people had lived close to the earth for a long, long time, people started to question the old ways and wonder why it was necessary to have a central governance. <clears throat> There was a lot of complaining and greed and questioning. Maybe the old God was dead. Maybe it didn't matter anymore that people come together and go by the harmony of the old ways. Maybe it was time for a revolution. It was the custom in those days for every three years for a congress of all of the leaders of the land to come together. And they would, at that time, come into the great hall of Tara. And in the great hall, they would be reminded of the harmony that held them all together. And the king of Tara would speak to them of the old ways. But this year, they came together and they stayed outside of the great hall. They didn't go in. They gathered around the outskirts, and the kings and chieftains, great and small, were talking. They were of all different opinions, and some of them were saying, Why does the king of Tara have all of this land? What's the purpose of this? He has too much land. And others spoke up and said, But this is the way it's always been. And these are the ways that it was set out so that it would all work amongst us. But there was greed in their hearts, and they were wanting to take some of the land of, of the Great Hall of Tara. So they went finally to the gate of the, of the king, and knocked on the gate and talked about the dissension in the land and the chaos, and that they were feeling that something different needed to be done, and there needed to be a dividing up and a decentralizing and uh, a changing of the way that it was all taking place. And so the, um, the king was summoned forth, and they, they did all meet together and wondered what to do. And they said, you know, we need to call on a great spirit man. We need to find a great spirit man. Is there one that still exists in the land? And so they sent word far and wide, and they waited, and they waited. And finally, a man came. They said he was taller than a tree, and he walked with every step connected to the earth. He was a spirit man, and his name was Finton, great Finton, a druid. And he came forth into the assembly of all of the chieftains and kings, and he said, what's, what's the matter? What's happening here? And they talked about their, their ideas that Tara needed to be divided up and decentralized, and why did they have this central place called Meath here anyway? It didn't make sense to them anymore. And so uh, Fenton said, well, this is not new. 
This has happened many times before. He said, I have lived on this earth hundreds and thousands of times. And through many risings and fallings of many kingdoms, I've been a salmon, and I've been a bird, and I've been a king, and I've been a queen, and I've been a carpenter and a painter, and, you know, he's been many things, seen many things. So this has not happened just this time, he's saying. And they said, but chaos has come, and, and evil is in our midst, and we need to be able to, to make our own decisions and decide what we're going to do in our local areas. And he said, that's all well and good, but let me tell you, when this happened one time, a long, long time ago, they called forth a great spirit man. And this is what he did. He gathered all of the people together from all of the hamlets, not just the kings and the chiefs, but he called forth for communities to come, all the artisans, especially the artisans, the creators, the women and the children, for everyone to come forth in their communities and to ask them if they remembered, if they remembered the old ways. And so this great spirit man from long ago, Fenton said, told them this. He said, you must remember it inside of you. And Fenton said, and I was one of the Druids back then. And he called me forth and he said, do you remember? Do you remember the wheel of the circle of life? And Fenton said, in his innermost being, he knew it was there, but no one had spoken it for a very long time. And so he didn't really know the teachings. But this great spirit man was asking him in front of all the people, do you remember? And so he felt his roots going down into the earth, and he stood tall, and he spoke forth what he remembered. And he said, yes, I remember. I remember the circle. Knowledge and wisdom come from the West. There we must sink down and soak in wisdom. And the battle over life and death comes from the North. The only true battle is the one within. It's where we go to test ourselves, to refine and challenge ourselves. Then all other battles diminish. And prosperity dwells in the East. It's where we learn of the beauty of life and how to share it. And music and poetry dwell in the South. That's where we heal ourselves and remember the great song within. And at the center dwells sovereignty. The center is where we are in right standing with our own destiny. We're in right standing with ourselves and then therefore with all the people around us and with the animals and the plants and the earth beneath us as it has always been and it will always be from the beginning until the end of time is our mother. <coughs> and the great spirit man replied to Fenton and said, very good memory, Fenton. Now I will tell you. And the great spirit man of old and olden days repeated what Fenton had said, but with a slight change. He said, each of the directions has her power and knowledge waiting there that can teach and guide you and temper and heal you. Her knowledge of the wisdom dwells in the West. Her knowledge of battle dwells in the North. The Great Mother's knowledge of prosperity dwells in the East and teaches you of the hearth and the fire that must be kept alive in your midst. Her knowledge of poetry and music dwells in the South, and it's her sovereignty that dwells in the center. When Fenton finished telling the story to the kings and chieftains that were gathered there in his time, a peaceful calm fell over, everyone assembled. 
And the chieftains and kings looked at the king of Meath, the king of Tara, with new eyes and realized that he was not just a man, but that he was a man who was honoring, honoring the sovereign goddess in the center of Ireland. And the king looked out upon all of the kings and chieftains with new eyes and compassion, and he realized that it's easy for humans to forget who we are and that we must return to the center over and over again to remember the true harmony and order of things. So the spirit men and the spirit women come over and over again to remind us, to remind us of this ancient wisdom that's been on planet Earth since the beginning of time. You, my friends, my spiritual friends, are those spirit men and spirit women and spirit children who know deep within your own beings the harmony, the harmony that is at the center. And we're here to remind others of it. We're here to tune in deep within to ourselves and then remind others. So we have a wonderful song to do now that um, Heather has brought to us many times over, and it's a, it's a good one to repeat today because it's about the face of God, the face of God, and how do we know the face of God? The song will show us. <laughs> Carol Huntley and Karen Drucker. Um, we've done it many times. And don't we need to remind each other a lot that we are faces of God and reflections and the beauty within? So we get to have some fun with this and be a little interactive. Um, we'll sing it once or twice in place, and then you're going to find another, another face of God, somebody else to sing it to. And... If you can each, when we get to that part, say one word that you see in the other person. If you can both do that with each other before you sing, just one word. You know, whether it's beauty, honesty, humor, whatever comes to you when you look at that other, that other reflection. So let's stand up and sing it a couple times, and then we will sing it to each other and share that word, whatever it is. You are the face of God. I hold you in my heart. I hold you in my heart. You are a part of me. You are a part of me. We are one family. We are one You 
Face of God, face of God, right here in our midst. Every religion all over the planet, in all of time, has had something to say about God. <laughs> yeah, religion, right? Okay. So, but, but, you know, there have been many evolutions of religions all through time. And people have had to go, humans have had to go through all kinds of journeys about who is God, who is God. And I, in my own lifetime, have been through quite a journey about who is God. And I bet you have too. Well, who is God is continually changing. And we as humans have to accept that. And I like that story of Fintan, the Druid of old, because he was uh, comforting the people by reminding them, humans of all times and ages have gone through this forgetting and remembering and seeking and desiring to belong and wondering how to belong. So what about you? Why don't you, as, as I'm going to talk a couple minutes here about my journey, <coughs> during my lifetime, I want you to feel into your journey and how yours might be similar to mine or different from mine. But this journey to know who God is is unfolding within us all the time. And so I, born in the 50s, in a small town, much like this town, <coughs> surrounded by farms and by a Native American reservation, and I was thankful in my childhood that I had a grandmother and wonderful kin who were very close to the earth. And so I grew up with a sense of the supernatural in the earth and all around us and the Native American influence, of course. And then I was a teenager in the 60s. And during that time, there was a lot of ferment in the land and chaos and questioning. And I remember my grandmother going into a lot of questioning and not liking the president at that time and not liking the Vietnam War. And I remember my father going to take classes at the University of Buffalo and the, the students were in an uprise and there were, uh, he had to deal with tear gas bombs and all sorts of things happening in our culture. 
And there were questions going on. There was chaos in the land. And, and at that time, it became uh, a theological question to wonder, was God dead? You remember that? Yeah. It came out of existentialism. And um, there was a, a, a need in people to debunk and deconstruct who God had been. And today, to share my journey with you, I realized that the poetry of May Sarton is, um, is very apropos for the journey that I've been through, and f maybe for the journey that many of you have been through. Do you know May Sarton? Any of you read her? Some of you have. It's, it's worth looking her up because she's one of the poet laureates of the United States. And she, um, she's a little older than me, uh, but um, she was, uh, for example, a, a teenager in the late 50s. And so she was writing poetry by the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. And her poetic journey is a journey about knowing God through all the different changes that she went through and our culture went through. So the first poem that I'm going to have Karen come up and read is a difficult poem to hear because May Sarton started writing her poetry during the Civil Rights Movement and during the um, aftermath of World War II and during the Vietnam War. And so she was questioning a lot and wondering, who is God? And has God died? And what have we done to God? So, so just know that in life, it's okay to question. And it's okay to wonder even to the core of it all. And to say to ourselves, who is God? Where is God? And what have we done to God? So Karen's going to come and read this poem by Mason. <clears throat> Are we on? Yeah. The concentration camps. Have we managed to bathe them out like God? Ellipse the unpurged images. Ellipse the children with a mountain of shoes. Let bones fester like animal bones. False teeth, bits of hair, spill liquid eyes. Disgusting not to be looked at, like a blight. Ages ago, we closed our hearts to blight. Who believes now? Who cries, merciful God? We gas God in the ovens, burned God in a trash heap of images, refused to make a compact with dead bones, and threw away the children with their shoes. Millions of sandals, sneakers, small worn shoes, thrust them aside as a disgusting blight. Not ours like death to take into our bones, not ours a dying mutilated God. We freed our mind from gruesome images, pretended we had closed their open eyes that could never be closed, dark puzzled eyes. The ghost of children who went without shoes, naked toward the oven's bestial images. Strangling for breath, clawing the blight, piled up like pigs beyond the help of God. With food in our stomachs, flesh on our bones, we turned away from the stench of bones, slept with the living, drank in sexy eyes, hurried for shelter from a murdered God, New factories turned out millions of shoes. We hardly noticed the blight. Stuffed with new cars, ice cream, and rich images. But no grass grew on the raw images. Corruption mushroomed from decaying bones. Joy disappeared. The creature of the blight rose in the city's dark, smothered eyes. Our children danced with rage in their shoes grew up to the question, who had murdered God? We evaded their too attentive eyes and walked the path of death in our new shoes. 
sweated with anguish and remembered God. Mm, you did a great job reading that, Karen. Yeah, okay, it's hard to hear. It's hard to read. It's hard to be with. And right now, what just happened in Boston, it's hard to be with. It's hard to read. It's hard to see on the news. And yet I know people all over this country are steeped in it right now and are watching and are all too prone to um, think, where's the bad guy? And let's get him. You know, and then it's all resolved when one bad guy is gotten. You know, but what if it's not like that? You know, what if we're all in this together, us humans? What if it's more like bacteria in our body? You know, like we're all made up of bacteria and we're so bent on killing the bad bacteria, but it doesn't really work anymore. Antibiotics are failing. It's not working anymore to do this, this killing of the bad guy and that God is just good and removed from it all and we, we're here to do these battles and get rid of things. It's not really working anymore. And we in the 60s and 70s realized that. As young people, we realized no more war. No, it's not working anymore. And so we protested in the streets. And during that time, I was thinking about going on to seminary. And I was thinking about being a Methodist minister. And I needed something hopeful and positive to be able to preach about. And so I turned to several places. One of them was nature. I went out for walks in the forest every day while I was in theological study. That grounded me. And then also I found Paul Tillich. Have any of you heard about Paul Tillich? You know, he was a German, and then he came to New York City and was one of the great theologians of the 60s. And he, um, he gave me and lots of seminarians great hope during that time. Um, he said that we are all really one all over the planet. He was saying that way back then. And I remember I used to quote it a lot, and I can't remember the exact quote, but it was that if we all would sink down, sink down to the roots of our own faith traditions, not run away from them, that there we would find that we were all connected, that the roots of all the faith traditions were all connected. So that became a path for me a trajectory, to go ahead and not be afraid of my Christian, Judeo-Christian faith tradition, but to sink down into it. And that, that led me through to Matthew Fox and creation-centered spirituality. And so in the early 80s, um, there was a, a whole new movement afoot within Christianity that I could handle and relate to. And Matthew Fox wrote, first of all, the book I found in the late 70s was called The Musical Mystical Dancing Bear. <laughs> and I couldn't believe the title of it was in a theology store. And it was a portent of, of what this new kind of spirituality, new old spirituality was about. It was about that we are mystical beings and that we are connected with the animals and that we need to tune into that kind of energy. And then that led through to his next book, Original Blessing. And that was about how we aren't originally cursed or originally sinners. We're all, all humans are originally blessed. And that we have this knowing within us, just like Finton was saying. And then another thing that happened in the late 70s and early 80s, I don't know if any of you remember because you, you weren't necessarily theologians, but a lot was going on in Nicaragua and in Central and South America, the disappearados were going on, difficult things. And at the same time, the liberation theologians arose. And they were um, priests and nuns, so they'd grown up Catholic, and a lot of Catholic people with them. And they were rereading the teachings of Jesus from a new eye and a new light because of all the difficulties going on around them. And in those old teachings, they found a new truth that was the Sophia lineage, that was the lineage of the feminine within Jesus. And, and they talked about that he had a preferential, uh, a, a preferential, I forget the next word, a preference for the poor, anyway. And that he, Jesus, and that they, therefore, would turn toward the poor and ask them what they needed. And out of that arose liberation theology. So now I'm going to have another one of May Sarton's poems read. 
that's called The Caged Bird. And I had asked Patrice to read it, but she went out with the kids, so um, Caged Bird, I guess I'll read it. <laughs> he was there in my room, a wild bird in a cage. But I was a guest, so it was not for me to open the gate and set him free, however great my gloom and unrepenting rage. But not to see and not to hear was difficult to try. The small red bird burst into song and sang so sweetly all day long, I knew his presence near and his inquiring eye, so we exchanged some words, and then I scattered seed and put fresh water in his pan and cleaned the litter from his pen, wondering about caged birds. What more this one might need. But oh, when night came, then I started up in fear because there was a fierce wing beating of despair hurled at the bars, hurting the air, and the heart wild within as if a hawk so strong. The room was sealed and dark and that war all within where on the small cramped stage the bird fought with his cage and then beaten lay down, almost extinguished spark. And when I went back to bed, trembling, with nothing I could do, as if this scene had grown so huge, it ripped apart all subterfuge. And naked now, as God, I wept hot tears like blood. Isn't that a great poem? So we have to look. We have to hear the caged birds around us and, and turn, like the people of Central and South America did, to have a preference for actually opening to see and hear difficulties that are going on around us, but with a much more expanded heart, because as each generation of us humans comes along, we are more and more knowing our interbeingness with the entire planet, with everyone and everything. So our, um, our theology expands and grows. And the next thing that happened to me was Feminist theology. Women started coming of age in the sense that they were allowed in seminaries. They were allowed to look at the ancient manuscripts in Germany and all over Europe. And they started discovering the medieval Christian mystics who were mostly women, whose texts had been preserved. And Hildegard of Bingen and Julian of Norwich and all of these uh, incredible mystical women who had lived and been close to the earth and written about Christianity all tied up with earth-based spirituality and beautiful things started coming forth in the 80s and 90s of the mysticism in our own heritage throughout Europe. Oh. And then in the 90s, many of us heard a drumbeat, the drumbeat of Native American people. Many people all over the planet, for whatever the reason is, started to perk up and hear the drumbeat of the Native people in our own hearts. And we began being called to earth-based spiritualities and to study Native American teachings and to go to indigenous places in the Amazon and all over the planet to tune in again, to listen more deeply into these mystical realms that are so connected with the earth-based earth spiritual ways. So blessed be to those indigenous peoples who survived so much chaos and who are surviving, sometimes barely, today. All of the onslaught of this, whatever this is that we're doing on planet Earth, <laughs> this ravaging of it. Blessed be that they have survived and one of the things that I became really drawn to do was to funnel resources to them. And so I set up these um, journeys with the Huicholes in, in Central in Mexico, and we funneled a lot of money and resources to them through the 90s. And then I set up um, uh, journeys that I took people into South America throughout Brazil and Peru, and always we would bring, I would tell them, bring a lot of money because we want to give it to them, to help them. That's the least we can do coming from North America. And they, in turn, share 
shared their rich spiritual teachings with us. So I'd like to do that again. I'd like to have our Unity community be deeply connected with the Weecholes over this next year. They're in need of our help because their children are leaving and for the first time in their long faithful history. Their land is being attacked by miners from Canada. Their weary kuta, their, their heart land, their hearth place is being ravaged. And so there's needs out there for us to connect with the earth-based spiritual peoples and help them. And then in the 2000s, quantum physics has become popular parlance. And the Mayan calendar came into focus. And unity consciousness. And we've, as a human race, come to remember that we are much more interbeing and much more one with the center of the Milky Way galaxy, with the heartbeat of the universe, than we had remembered for a long, long time. And quantum physics has brought us so much expansion of our minds, and it's been incorporated within the unity teachings, and um, we're, we're taught that we are actually a part of a universe in which the God particle has been seen by scientists. So science and religion have come together in a powerful way in the 2000s. It's showing that at the very heart of each cell of our body, in our mitochondria, that there is a fire, a spark, a fire. And at the heart of the universe, there is this spark, this fire they're calling the God particle. So in our times, much is being revealed. Um, I'd like to end with a, another poem by May Sarton. Uh, no, it's not the ending poem. It's, there's one more poem and then the ending poem. And I've asked um, Anya to come and read this poem. And what is the title of it, Anya? The Sleeping God. High in Nepal, the lock sprang at last. There Vishnu lies entranced upon his pool, and there I was touched deeply and held fast, was dreamed and delved each nerve put to school, dreamed by his fertilizing power at rest, while anguish flowed away under his rule. God, flower fragile, open to the least, naked to every pulse of air and light, more vulnerable, in fact, than any beast, young man relaxed in beauty, and so slight he seems to float upon his dangerous sleep, daring to dream, exposed to the daylight. He lies there on the coil, massive loop of the eternal snake, a sovereign disarmed, without a wall, without a keep, and renews all within his fertile reign, and so become the master of all space, is pure creation that can know no pain. I saw him naked as a holy place, a human heaven which had learned to float the universe upon a sleeping face. And I, the Western one, was lost in thought, felt the lock spring, demons fly out, and all cracked open as the image caught knew I was dreamed back to some ancient school where we are filled within a single rule. True power is given to the vulnerable. True power is given to the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So may certain too, um, <coughs> many of us did she went east, and she um, there encountered what she called the sleeping god. And maybe some of you who have traveled in the Far East have seen the relaxing Kuan Yin. Mm -hmm. You've seen that statue of Kuan Yin relaxing? 
So we're talking here about all the different faces of God that we in our lifetime have encountered. And I wonder if you can relate to them as being within you. All these different um, experiences of who God is are actually experiences of your unfolding lifetime and your search and all the things that happen around us. So as to who God is, um, Elie Wiesel, who came out of the concentration camp, said, God was right there experiencing all of that. That's who God is. God is in you, evolving who God is. Wow. God made God's self vulnerable. That's what that poem, The Sleeping God, is referring to. God somehow mysteriously made God's self so vulnerable that God came within us and gave God's self to evolution, to evolving of knowing who God is through us. You get what I'm saying? It's quite an awesome mystery. Mm. The transformation that has occurred within me happened because I was able to over and over again allow things to deconstruct and then really go down into a deep place where I didn't know and where I, where I met despair different times even and, and just felt like, what next? How can, how can this uh, come through on planet Earth? And there, over and over again, I met God. And as it says in Notasaka Shange's um, wonderful writing, I met God and she loved me fiercely and the rainbow was enough. And so that's where we go, to that deep, deep place. You can call it your heart if you wish. It has to do with being aware of the world around us and our place in the world, and it has to do with claiming our belonging. So the last May Sarton poem is a short one entitled Mad March. And I thought it was good for our time because it's spring, you know, it's a springtime poem. And it expresses at least a part of what I'm trying to say here. It speaks to me of spring and how the holy can appear to us right in the midst of whatever's happening in our ordinary world, our world of chaos and war and bombs going off, our world of sickness and death and fears and doubts and greed. Even right here, right now, God, goddess, can appear to us in the depths of our own heart, in the faces of one another, in the beauty all around us, the croaking frogs, the flowers coming up. God is here. And here's the poem. The strangely radiant skies have come to lift us again out of winter's gloom. A paler, more transparent blue, a softer gold light, on fresh green grass. It is a naked time that bears our slightly worn out hopes and cares and sets us listening for the frogs and sends us to seed catalogs to bury our starved eyes and noses in the extravagance of roses <laughs> and order madly in this March season when we've had enough of reason. That's the poem. It says it all, really, doesn't it? What do we have to do when the Boston bombs go off? Go to the seed catalogs. <laughs> and bury our starved eyes and noses in the extravagance of roses and order madly at this season. Order madly at this season the hopes for the future. When we've had enough of reason, we enter into that place where we are in praise of the divine, still dancing in our hearts. Mm. Mm. I'd like you to, um, last week we did 
something where we turned to one another in a small group. And I'd like you just to take a few moments right now to gather in little groups, more than two, like groups of three or four, and just reflect for a couple moments on anything that I've said about who God is, or on your what you've come to. So just a few sentences, not a long sharing, but just a few sentences, looking at the face of one another who have gathered here, and say a couple things to each other in little small groups, who God is. I think it's important to ground it this way, to bring it all the way through to riding the bicycle in this moment, claiming that you know something, like Finn about God. Okay, don't know. Okay. And that But I, I saw it. It was so wonderful. So I just
now we're going to slowly, gently gather ourselves back and take the offering. spiritual journey, which is that um, my ancestry really is from Ireland. My grandmother, who I often speak of, was Irish, old blood Irish, and um, I've never been to Ireland. And this summer when Misha is going to France, you know, for the Cannes Festival, that she and I are going to go to Ireland. And I, I saw online that um, amazing synchronicity of it is that this year the Irish people have put out a message all over the world that they are doing what they're calling welcoming us all home and they're calling out to Irish people all over the world Irish heritage people to come home in 2013 and so I'm so blessed <laughs> finally getting to go there visit and I know that I'll experience something big. It's the next stage of my spiritual coming to know of who God is for being able to be able to be there. So I, I will miss not being with you in the month of June, but you can know that I'm, I'm having my next spiritual revelation. <laughs> See if you can touch base with Fenton while you're there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I will. <laughs> Let's bless the offering. Thank you for giving your energy as well as your, as your money, your energy in many ways. Let's bless our offering by saying, Divine love, through me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I give, have, all that I give and all that I receive. Thank you, God. Thank you, everybody. So it is. And now we'd love for you to get in a big circle, because after all, we can't just talk about the circle, the circle of life. We must get in a circle. <laughs> like riding the bike again, right? We've got to get in a circle. And we'll do this wonderful final song that Heather has prepared for us. It feels like a Gaelic song. It feels like a Native American song. It feels very earth-based. and. It's, uh, there's a little bit of, of learning to do with it, so, yes. Sure. I just want to say it's Jane Sterling's birthday. Oh, yes. And she can't be here because she's sick. Oh. Anyway, I made a birthday cake for Jane, and it's here, and it's gluten-free. <laughs> so, please help yourself. Oh, thank you, Karen. Well, you know, we should probably... Sing a happy birthday to Jane. She's such a servant leader in our midst, and and she'll she said she's going to watch the recording afterwards. So, so Jane, here it is. This is for you. We love you and appreciate you, and behold the light of God shining in your face. <laughs> yes, happy birthday.
So this is Oya oh Heya by Ricky Byers, Michael Beckwith. And if you could sing the chorus, that would be wonderful. Oya oh yeah, Heya, yeah, which means praise the spirit. Hallelujah. That's basically all the words to the chorus. And then you'll hear me sing some other important words here.
Amen. 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 Amen.